let's welcome Pastor Greg Mitchell tonight. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I am grateful to all of you coming out, men that are hungry for God, and want God to use your life, and, and I appreciate you making the effort to come and be here. God is doing great things in, in our uh, fellowship. I just got back from South Africa. South Africa, they planted 17 new churches, one of those in a new country in, in uh, Ethiopia planted there and that very exciting Dave Stevenson was telling me just got back from Cebu uh, in the Philippines and they planted 15 churches out of that conference and so uh, those are just two of the many conferences going on all the time and so the work of God is going on we're a part of something very very exciting how many can say amen to that thank God turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 14 I uh, read a, a fascinating article. This article was dealing with something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning and Kruger were two researchers. And they made uh, observations, and they wound up calling this the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is the Dunning-Kruger effect. It is a cognitive bias where people of low ability expertise or experience, they tend to overestimate their ability or knowledge. So when they tested people, after the test, they, they tested them on grammar, logic, even humor. They said, how do you think you did on the test? And they said, people who actually were not very smart all that, I aced it. Oh, I did, I, oh, that was easy. But then when the scores came out, the scores were nothing like their confidence. And so they call this the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's people who have, they're very sure of their ability, abilities, but it means they are blinded to reality. That is true in salvation and discipleship. The story that we're going to read, Peter is delusional. He is completely misinformed internally. He thought he was much stronger than he actually was. And Jesus says he needs to face the truth. This is Something that is very important, we're going to talk about delusional discipleship. Because it is possible if you can't see the truth about yourself, you have no hope of making progress in God. I want to preach about delusional discipleship. We're going to read Mark 14, verse 27 through 31. The, then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I'll go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if all, even if everyone else are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster, crows twice, you will deny me three times, but he spoke more vehemently, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said, likewise, delusional discipleship. I want to talk about self-delusion. Every single person has areas of lack in their life. They have areas of need. And this is true for, I don't care, age, education, it's irrelevant. Everyone has areas of need. There are things that we all just don't know. What you don't know may be different than another person. Maybe because of a lack of experience, you don't know it yet. Or maybe it's a lack of understanding. But there are things, everyone has things we just don't know. We have things we're not good at. Every person has things. You're just not good at it. 
That might be different. People skills for one, one man, communication ability, organizing, planning, just we're not good at it. And then we can have things that actually are wrong with us inside, areas of weakness. Verse 27, Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble. You have areas that you are weak inside. And he's, he's not singling anyone out. He just said, that is the way that life works. So Jesus, who knows everything, he says things you don't know, things you're not good at, things that are wrong with you or your areas you are weak in. So that's true for everyone. Our text says this is the problem. We tend to think we're doing better than we actually are. It's possible to be blinded to reality. We don't realize that there are things we don't know. We don't realize, we can't see. You're not good at this. You don't understand there are things wrong. Let me give you a tip, and you can use this for the rest of your life. If anyone ever offers you a breath mint, take it. <laughs> bro, you want a breath mint? No, I'm okay. No, bro, would you like a breath mint? Have five, have 10. You can't smell your own stink. Flowers are wilting, birds are falling out of the sky, small children are fainting, and you have no idea. Blinded to reality, that's, that's the truth. The Dunning-Kruger effect, which Peter, he was ahead of his time, Actually, it's not just that you are blinded. The problem is we can be blinded, but we are completely confident in things that we don't know. It's not like you don't see it, but you're quietly in a corner lacking confidence. No, no, no. Verse 29, Peter said, if everyone else stumbles, I will never do it. Not, he can't see himself, but more than that, he is confident about this. Listen to this. The researchers said in many cases, incompetence doesn't leave people uh, uh, disoriented, uh, perplexed, or cautious. Instead, incompetent people often have inappropriate confidence, which to them feels like Knowledge. Had a man in our fellowship years ago. He was a pastor. He used to tell people, I'm one of the best preachers in the fellowship. The problem is no one else thought so. So he's going through life like, I don't know if you know. Confident in something that just simply wasn't true. Now, sometimes it can be that uh, uh, our confidence is based on small knowledge or small success. Researchers says a tiny bit of knowledge on a subject can lead people to mistakenly believe that they know all there is to know about it. Or we can put it another way, a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. Maybe Peter was talking about, did you see me on that outreach? Did you see me baptizing those people? <laughs> Jesus, I will never. So we're blinded to reality, but we're overly confident while we're blinded. And thirdly, our confidence can be completely delusional. It has no connection, no basis in reality at all. Charles Darwin said, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. Had a man I was dealing with, he was encouraging people in the church to come to him. He's just in the body, come to him with their complaints. He's speaking against the pastor. Finally, I had to get involved. I'm challenging this man. Why would you do that? And he said, because I'm a leader. I said, a leader of what? Why? 
And I, I said, let's look at the evidence. He had gone out to pastor several times. You've never successfully built a church. You have no converts. What are you a leader of? That's delusional. This is Peter. I would never. Those guys, I would never, ever do that. So the question is why? Why is it that we can be confident while being totally wrong? What is it that would cause us to do that? I think there are a number of reasons. Number one, relying on self-assessment. Peter said, I will not stumble. He's not asking Jesus, he's telling. Like the little boy who announced to his dad, I'm nine foot tall. Dad said, how do you think you're nine foot tall? He said, because I made my own ruler. Yeah, you just make it whatever you want it to be. And then announce. This is what happens. You, you have guys that they come. Let me, let me, let me give you a tip. I'm, it's good when guys come and tell their pastor that God is doing something or they're making themselves available. These are two very different statements. I am making myself available or I'm willing versus I'm ready. Those are two very different statements. Because sometimes you have guys who they announce, I'm ready. It's like, you just quit smoking last month. <laughs> and you're ready to pastor? Like, that's, that doesn't make sense. I'm ready for a larger church. I'm ready for leadership. It's fascinating. You get a few guys in an area, they start fighting. Who's going to be the leader? Because they are self-assessing, I'm ready. Peter, I am ready to die for you. And Jesus says, Peter, here's, here's a truth bomb. Before the night's out, you'll deny me three times. Okay, you're assessing yourself. Self-assessment doesn't work well. Number two, comparison. That's why we can be confident and delusional. Verse 29 Peter said, even if everyone else are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Listen to the researchers. They said, low performers are unable to recognize the skill and competence level of other people, which is part of the reason why they consistently view themselves as better, more capable, and more knowledgeable than others. You know what we do in life is we find someone who in our minds is doing worse than us. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, we don't class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves because they measuring themselves by themselves, comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Mike Tyson was arrested for rape and when they asked him about this, he said, I'm no Mother, Mother Teresa, but I'm no Charles Manson either. Right? So I'm not like that mass murderer, so I'm okay. Comparison will cause you to come to wrong conclusions. Then, of course, failing to correctly evaluate. There are people that have confidence, but if you're doing so good, why are you in constant conflict with people? How come everywhere you go, people want to kill you? If you're doing so good why are you in constant poverty why don't you ever get out of poverty why constant barrenness why do you have repeated patterns of sin and failure you're ignoring contradictory evidence Amos 2 4 says their lies lead them astray they will not uh, look at the evidence objectively your opinion doesn't match the reality of what is going on. And then, of course, finally, the reason why people have misplaced confidence is often they're protecting their self-worth. Somewhere in the past, someone made them feel stupid, feel worthless, and so they hate that feeling. 
They don't ever want to feel like that again. So they create false information that makes them feel better about themselves. Some guys think if I say it loudly, if I say it boldly, it becomes true. That's what Peter's doing. <laughs> Jesus, Peter with his mouth, no way will I ever failure. There was a lady named Florence Foster Jenkins. Florence loved to sing, especially she loved opera. The problem was Florence couldn't sing. She was terrible at it. The problem is Florence inherited a lot of money. So she was able in New York City to rent the ballroom at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel she booked out Carnegie Hall for concerts. And people would come to laugh. They called her the tone-deaf diva. She was so bad while she was singing, people would laugh and clap. And, how, and she is up there thinking, they love me. Self-delusion. Let's talk secondly about the damage of delusion. Jesus, he does not accept Peter's assessment because he said, this is actually dangerous. This is not good for you to have misplaced confidence. The problem is that we fail to change. Self-delusion blinds us. You will never change if you can't see that you need to change, Psalm 19, verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret or hidden faults. See, if you can't see yourself, coming to church, sermons actually don't do you any good because every sermon is a shovel sermon. You know what a shovel sermon is? While they're preaching, you go, amen, that's right. That guy needs it, and they need it. And it ne self-deluded disciples never ask questions. Because why would you ask a question? You're confident that you already know. Think about this. Peter is not asking Jesus. This is God in the flesh. He is not asking Jesus. Do you think it's possible that... I could deny it. No, he's telling. Researchers say we're unable to recognize expertise in others, so we don't ask for help. We don't ask questions. You know, I travel. Part of what I do is, of course, preaching, but part of the value when I travel is it gives access. Guys can ask me questions. I spend a great portion of my life answering questions. I love it. I don't, I don't resent questions in any way. Because I'm able, I have a perspective of what I've seen and experienced. Do you know I go places, they ask me to come and speak, and the entire time I'm there, they ask me no questions. Like, there isn't anything you want to know? Or worse, sometimes, not only do they not ask questions, I spend the time listening to them tell me their theories of how the fellowship should be run and the key to revival. <laughs> and because I'm polite, I never poke them in the eye. You have, you have disciples in a church. You know, the word, this is a discipleship class. You know what that means? It's a learner class. It's those who want to learn. How can it be that you can be a disciple and never ask a single question? Isn't there anything you want to know about the Bible? Why we do what we do in the church? Nothing. Self-deluded disciples never seek to better themselves. You know, people who are successful 
They're always trying to get better. They want to know more how they can do that. But if you already think you're great, why would you try to get better? There's no need. I'm here. I would never fail. That's Peter. So what happens if you are blinded year after year, you stay the same. While others are passing you, are growing by leaps and bounds because they have the humility to ask, to seek to better themselves. Second problem with self-delusion is that you treat other people as competitors. Verse 29, Peter said, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Peter is, in life is automatically thinking in terms of got to be better than those guys. If your opinion is too high of yourself, you don't want anybody else to be better than you, so you compare, generally finding someone worse off, and you compete. Some men, they treat discipleship as a competition. Isn't that what the disciples are? Jesus said, hey, what were you guys talking about while you were walking on the road? Uh, they didn't want to say it. They were arguing about who's the greatest. And my question is, what is the basis of that conversation? I prayed for a guy, his leg grew out one inch. That's nothing. He grew out two inches when I prayed. He had no head. And I, I mean, come on. <laughs> it's a competition. And what you do then in discipleship is you resent anyone else getting any attention, anyone else getting any opportunities. Sometimes you will fail to help. A brother has an outreach. He could really use some help for some people to witness and help work the outreach. There are some disciples, they will not help because what if his outreach goes great? And then next Sunday, he gives a report about how 100 people got saved. So, ah, bro, I'm really busy, like, for the next 29 years. I can't help you. Speaking against your brothers, trying to make them look bad, Proverbs 10, 18 says, hiding hatred makes you a liar, but slandering others makes you a fool. Third thing that happens in self-delusion is you resent people who tell you the truth. You know, there are disciples who are sitting in church. I, I guarantee there were disciples in every church represented here who were sitting in the service mad at their pastor. How can he not see how great I am, how ready I am you know what I think it is? I think it's a conspiracy. That's what it is. He just plays favorites. Or else, the self-deluded resent being told the truth. King Ahab, I got an idea. Get the other king, let's go. We're gonna go to, go to war. And the other king said, I don't know, is there another prophet that we could ask? Listen to this. Ahab said, there is another prophet, but I hate him because he never prophesies good things. He never tells me what I want to hear. So clearly he's the Antichrist. Right? I, I can't. Final thing is that you make yourself vulnerable. That is the point of the story here. Overconfident disciples are vulnerable to hell because they don't feel the need to be careful. 
1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, if you think you are strong, you should be careful not to fall. That's what Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, you don't get it. You in particular, you're all going to deny you three times before the night is over. And Peter doesn't believe it. If you are self-deluded, at some point the truth will break in on you. And it's here that some men, the shock and the shame causes them to make wrong decisions. Matthew 26, 75, Peter remembered the word of Jesus who said before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. When there's a reality check in relationships, finances, ministry, whatever it might be, there are some, they, they can't handle that. Some people turn away from God's will. As Peter, after he denied, he said, you know, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to the old life that God called me away from. In fact, there are people that they even turn away from God because they're embarrassed or they think God hates them simply because the truth came out. Pastor was telling me he was invited to preach at a church and he preached a, a sermon on redemption, talking about how God redeems. If I remember right, he was preaching on the prodigal son and was just saying God loves to redeem people who have fallen into sin. God loves backsliders. He said a man came up to him after church and was, he said, I hated your sermon. And I was like, Why? I disagree with what you said about redemption. You said those people that they fall into sin, they can be redeemed. And so this pastor asked him, he said, what do you think should happen to people who fall into sin? He said, they need to die. You know, the problem was, that brother fell into sin. So now after being so confident and pointing the finger at everybody else, he fell into sin. And he's been telling that people like him should die. And the shame, he didn't survive. He didn't fix it. He left completely and turned away from his salvation. That's why Jesus says it's dangerous. Self-delusion is dangerous. Final thought, let's talk about healing delusion. The answer for delusion, which is a lie, is simply we need to face the truth. We have to ask God to help us see the truth. John 8, 32, you'll know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But of course, the truth can't set you free if you can't see it. So that's why David prayed in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David is being honest. God, help me. Show me myself let me see things about me that I can't see. Psalm 19, 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults, hidden faults. I'm not talking about secret sin. He's saying, God, help me. Cleanse me from things that I can't see about myself. That, that would be a wise, listen, when you're praying, don't just give a, God a shopping list of give me this and do that. Part of prayer needs to be an honesty. God, help me. Help me to survive myself. Help me to see myself. Second thing that needs to happen is we need an honest self-assessment. People can only, listen to this, researcher says, 
People can only evaluate themselves from their own limited and highly subjective point of view. From this limited perspective, they think they're highly skilled, knowledgeable, and superior to others. Because of this, sometimes they struggle to have a more realistic view of their abilities. So if you are very confident about how great you're doing, perhaps it would be helpful to look at the evidence. Where have you been having conflicts with people? And when you're having conflicts, what are they saying to you? Where is it you've been having struggles? Had a man that I was challenging him, his, what was coming out of his mouth was outrageous, and I said, brother, you are filled with pride. And he said, you know, people have been telling me that for years. <laughs> and I said, and when are you going to start listening? The evidence. Thirdly, we have to have an outside perspective. You can never fully assess yourself. You can pray, you can assess the evidence, but you're going to have to have someone outside help you. Jesus didn't need Peter's opinion. I think I'll never fail. Peter actually didn't need Peter's opinion. Peter needed Jesus' opinion. You know, in life, it might help you if you ask someone for the truth. And, and I don't mean, you know, I get, guys, if you see anything in my life, let me know. I learned a long time ago, people would tell me, if you see anything in my life, well, actually, oh, that wasn't really serious, was it? I'm not talking about some general, if you ever see anything in my life. I'm, I'm talking about getting honest. You have, a, you have a conflict, something's going wrong. Get a good brother. Get someone with some spiritual wisdom. Help me. Am I not seeing this correctly? Start with humility. You know, I think I'm struggling in this area. I keep having this reaction. I keep running into this problem. I, I need some help. What am I doing wrong in that? Because facing the truth is what brings the blessing of God. Thank God Peter learned his lesson. If you read John 21... Jesus graciously is waiting on the shore. Peter, I'm going, I'm going fishing. Jesus is waiting for him on the shore. And Peter, who was, felt superior to everyone else, he asks him, Peter, do you love me? And then the big question, do you love me more than these? But Peter learned his lesson by that time. He said, no. I just love you. I don't love more than them. I'm not better than them. I just love you. So apparently he saw things differently. Isn't it interesting in Peter's life in John 21, at the point that Peter faced the truth, Jesus was able to speak about his destiny. He said, let me tell you about the future now, Peter. But that's true for all of us. If we can be honest with God, that is the point, actually, that God can start talking to you about your future. That is actually when you start to grow truly, when you can see the truth. I close with this illustration there was a man in the 1800s. He was from Norway. He was a violinist. And uh, this man, Ole Bull, he performed a concert 
in Europe and a music critic wrote in the newspaper, I mean, it tore him apart saying how bad he was, how bad of a musician he was. Now, right there, some of you, what would you do? You, you would go look for the guy, right? I'm going to sort you out. Or you would tell all your friends, that guy's a jerk, don't listen to him. That is not what Ole Bull did. Instead, he went to the critic and he said, help me. What exactly do you see that I am doing wrong? And the man told him some specific areas in his technique that were wrong. And so he canceled the remainder of the tour. And for six months, he trained and practiced just focusing on the areas that the man point out. And then he went back to touring. And at age 26, he became the sensation of Europe. People raving about how great of a musician he was. So when he faced the truth, what could God do in your life if you would be honest? If you could get honest with God and ask him to help you? If you could get honest with other people? If you could assess yourself? What could God do in your life? Where could God take you? Because at the point that Peter faced the truth, that is where Jesus was able to speak about the future. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Now with our heads bowed, I want to speak to men first of all that The truth is, the Bible says we all have sinned. That is the truth. All of us have done wrong in the eyes of God, and our sin separates us from God. Sin will ruin and destroy. Sin will cut you off from God's help and blessing. Sin opens the door to habits and addictions and bondages that you can't break. And yet God does not give up on us because of our sin. Instead, because he loves us, he makes a way for us to go free from our sin. If you're here tonight, God would deal with you about your sin. You want to turn from your sin and have God forgive you, give you the power to live a new life. You need a miracle. You don't need self-help. You need a miracle. That only comes by facing the truth God, I am a sinner. I mentioned the prodigal son, the one who rebelled against his father's wishes, but then he got healed the day that he got honest and he said, I have sinned. If that's you tonight, if you need to be honest with God, right now you'd be honest and say, I'm living in sin and God would not be pleased with the way I'm living. You want to get honest with God and pray. God will forgive you. He'll do a miracle inside of you. How many here you say, I'm not right with God and I want to get right with God. I want to pray. If that's what you want, lift up your hand all across this place. Thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. These men are responding. How many others? I want to get right with God. I want to turn from my sin. God loves you, wants to help you. How many backsliders? You... Thank God I see this brother at the front. Thank you. How many backsliders? Lift up your hand. I want to come back. I need God to do a miracle inside of me. Lift your hand up. God loves you, wants to do a miracle. Thank you. God bless you. God sees these hands. Anybody else? Quickly, we're going to do something else in a moment. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I want every man that lifted your hand, stand up to your feet. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Wherever you are, stand up. Amen. Now come here. I want you to kneel down at the front. God bless you. Thank you. Kneel down at the front facing me. Someone's going to pray with every one of these men. I want a man to pray with every one of them. God bless you. Kneel down. Thank God for honest men. They want to get right with God. You help them. Lead them in a sinner's prayer before anything else. God bless you. 
Thank God you helped them to pray, every one of you. Thank God. Let's all stand up to our feet. Then, men, I'm giving you a challenge. Come and be honest with God. Let God help you. Let God open your eyes. They're going to sing while people are coming to the altar. God, help us, Lord God. Oh, God, I'm praying for the favor of God. Oh, God, I'm grateful, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God, son. Oh, God, help us, I pray, Lord God. Open the eyes of our understanding. Oh, God, deal with our hearts. Open our eyes, Lord God. Enable us to see the truth. Oh, God, open our eyes, Lord God. Let us have the humility to see. God, I'm asking that you're going to raise men up for your will. Oh, God, minister in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord God. God, without you, we can do nothing. We confess it. Oh, God, we need a miracle of understanding, Lord God. I pray that you would set us free from delusion. Open our eyes, God. Let truth Come in our hearts, Lord God. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord God, for your goodness. I believe you. Set the captive free, Lord God. I'm asking for a miracle of deliverance. Shandarabakai. Let's praise God together right now. Let's thank God for his goodness. Oh, God, I am grateful, Lord God, for your goodness. Yo lo bo corre de 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 be ay ara va re be 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 Thank you Jesus. Praise God. Amen. You can return to your seats and uh, Pastor Jesse is going to come and receive the offering. God bless you. Sanda re be 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 kia. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you again, every pastor, disciple. You've made the investment. Our next discipleship class, October 17th, with Pastor Richard Ruby. Amen. We're going to be dismissed this evening. Uh, pastor Chris Hart, if you'll close us in prayer.
Yes, thank you, Jesus. Shikorobobobosanda. Shianda rebebebe kiondo robobobosanda. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're dismissed tonight. God bless you this evening. Drive safely.